coming. Uh, it's really, it means a lot that you guys are here, took time out of your day uh, to come and, and listen to us. Uh, my name's Clayton Meyer. I'm a senior network engineer at Pinnacle. Uh, been here about four and a half years. Uh, been in uh, networking uh, for about 11 years, uh, focusing primarily on networking, uh, specifically data center networking, various server platforms, uh, a little bit of uh, wireless, and then some enterprise storage. And I'm Alan Bunyard. I've been with Pinnacle uh, nearly two years now as a pre-sales network architect. Um, I've worked as a network engineer for the last 10 years, uh, various industries, including manufacturing, healthcare, and casino gaming. Um, I'm a CCMP, CCDP with a heavy Cisco background in the everyday stuff we all work with all the time, like Catalyst, Nexus, ASA, and the uh, software we use to manage those platforms. Yeah, so I'm curious, has anybody ever attended Cisco Live? One? Only one? Two? A couple people? Well, so I'm, this is my second year attending it, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's the best conference I've ever been to. Um, it's definitely a technical-oriented conference. Um, it, it's very little marketing fluff. Uh, this is an engineer talking to other engineers and admins. Like, if you want a technical conference, I highly recommend it. It's worth the investment, worth the time. Um, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about our experience there, and then we'll talk about what we learned. Um, so there's over roughly 25,000 attendees at Cisco Lives. It's a big operation, and this is just the one. They have, they usually have one in Australia, they have one in Cancun, they have one in Europe, they have, I think, another part of the world. Um, so this is just the U.S.-based one. It's a usually different location every year. Um, there's over 1,400 sessions to pick from, so when you register, you literally get to pick from uh, roughly 1,400 different types of sessions, which are almost entirely technical in nature. Um, there's keynote addresses, there's the DevNet, which you can see on the picture. DevNet is a relatively new uh, thing that they have at Cisco Live, where it's focused entirely on development, scripting, um, programming, uh, automation. Uh, which we're going to talk a whole lot more about that later in the presentation. But DevNet is an area of the conference you can go to and just learn, do hands-on labs, and hear presentations on that. And then, the, of course, they have a customer appreciation event every year. This particular year, they, they rented out all of um, Universal Studios and Islands of Adventure, and Cisco Live attendees just got to take over the park, and they had live music, and uh, it was a good time. So. Um, what I did when I registered for sessions, I focused on things that were kind of stretching my uh, level of knowledge in areas I wasn't previously felt, felt comfortable in. So I focused on things like Identity Services Engine or ICE, uh, Network Segmentation, uh, DNA Center, which is a new product that we're going to talk more about, and then also uh, Programmability um, Automation. And I spent the majority of my time in DevNet. Um, and I pretty much all day, every day, uh, that and other courses around uh, service orchestration. Um, and uh, it was, I was there so much that uh, Clayton actually took a picture of a guy sitting in a DevNet workshop that looked like me. It's not in this presentation because it wasn't me. So, uh, but yeah. So we could have included it. Yeah. So um, I thought this was really interesting for all of my fellow geeks in the room. Um, it, it, as you can imagine, it takes a monumental amount of uh, effort and uh, equipment to host uh, 25,000 attendees. So this is a picture of the Cisco's like uh, mobile data center. They literally flew this in in crates and, and set this up just a few days before the conference. Um, they had redundant 7Ks, redundant wireless LAN controllers, redundant uh, storage. Uh, 6,800 switches, and then roughly uh, 800 plus wireless access points across the convention center. And um, really cool statistics from the, uh, they showed this at the end, uh, across their redundant 100 gig internet connections, uh, they transmitted about 75 terabytes of data uh, across five days of the conference, which is pretty incredible. 1.2 million malicious attacks blocked and at 1.20 thousand plus uh, concurrent wireless connections. So pretty cool stuff, big conference. So there are dozens of tracks to follow at Cisco Live and uh, no one person can follow even the tiny fraction of that. 
And uh, so as we were putting together, we, we, we wanted to narrow it down to the things that uh, we thought were important and then stick to uh, Cisco's theme of Imagine Intuitive. So uh, what was new? Um, and during the entire conference, not a single, single new hardware product was announced by Cisco. All new announcements were around software and uh, the APIs we used to interact with it. And um, the takeaway that they kept, kept telling us over and over again is uh, what, what does it mean uh, that we're all developers now? We're all programming our networks. So, so the areas we're going to cover and uh, let's see. We have network segmentation, which will be around the identity services policy engine. Uh, DNA center for orchestrating our software-defined networks. Uh, data center network manager, and I am going to do a demonstration of network program programmability uh, using an Alexa uh, enabled bot. She's always listening. <laughs> All right, so I'll start it off with network segmentation. Um, to start it off, I, I found this statistic really interesting. 90% uh, of the companies they surveyed aren't fully aware the device is accessing their network. They know the IP addresses, they know the MAC addresses, they have no idea what those devices are. Uh, I would say that's probably true for most organizations. 85% uh, of the cyber attack victims didn't even know that they'd been attacked for weeks after the, uh, the attack actually happened. Um, so why is network segmentation necessary? Um, you know, to answer that, you know, we kind of need to talk about traditional segmentation or traditional security. Traditionally, we would use things like ACLs, VLANs, uh, things like that. We would insert firewalls into the network to separate different business units, to separate different users on the network. And as we all know, ACLs are, are not easy to manage, uh, especially as your business grows. Uh, I would say that most of the time, people don't go back, audit their ACLs, and remove the ones that are no longer needed. They kind of just continue to snowball more and more and more uh, until you have so many and, and you don't want to remove any because you're afraid you might break something. Um, you know, in creating new VLANs and inserting them into the network to separate is good in certain cases, but it can become uh, problematic. Um, so one of the things we, we need to talk about is uh, this idea of properly identifying and categorizing your, your clients on the network. So to do that, you need to know who owns the device, is it vulnerable, when, when did it connect, what operating system, where is it located, all these different types of things will help you categorize those devices and then properly segment them. But without a good tool to do that, it, that, that task is incredibly difficult. Um, that's the kind of information we need to know. So Cisco's Identity Services Engine, or ICE, um, does that for you. It gives you a platform to identify those devices quickly, to authenticate the devices, to authorize those devices. It's a very important distinction between authenticating them and authorizing them. Um, and as you know, with IoT becoming such a big deal right now, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of new devices being created all the time. And so ICE is going to regularly update the product with new definitions to identify those devices so that you can categorize them uh, properly. Has anyone ever worked with ICE? Is anybody using it or familiar with it? A couple people? How, what's your experience been? Do you like it or difficult? No? It's, it's a decent program, but I'm also running a very old version. Are you running 1.4 or 3? I, I think that's... I think okay. So. It has changed. A lot. It went from, well, let's just call it a dumpster fire in 1.x to, <laughs> yes. uh, to what we have today is much easier to interface with, much more intuitive. So, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is a screenshot from one of the latest releases that come a long way. And you'll, you'll see a pattern as we go on, as we look at some of the other products. Uh, the user interface is becoming standardized, um, much more user friendly. So yeah, like you said, the earlier versions, clunky, difficult to work with, difficult to deploy. Um, so I think Cisco's come a really long way. Uh, as Alan mentioned, they're becoming more and more focused on software, and uh, I think it's a good thing. So let's talk about what happens when one of your IP-based devices gets compromised. The first thing that attacker is gonna do is try to pivot on the network. They're gonna try to move 
east, west, on the network to find another device that has elevated permissions or some sort of sensitive data that they can manipulate. Um, that's called pivoting. Uh, in a traditional network, if you just got a flat network or just one VLAN or even just a couple VLANs, there's really nothing that prevents that uh, particular attack from moving, from pivoting across that network. Um, and so that's where the goal of network segmentation comes in, is to break that up into logical groupings of devices that says this can only talk to that and that can only talk to this. So for example, um, things like an IP-based security camera, that's really common these days. Uh, a Roku streaming device in your conference room, we're seeing more of those, Apple TVs, things like that. Um, smart thermostat, those are getting installed all the time and usually IT is not even notified when something like that happens. They just <laughs> plug it in and someone starts using it. There's, there's no reason at all why, why devices like that would need to communicate with your SQL servers, your application servers, your domain controllers. Usually they're not going to be uh, joined to the domain or, or anything like that. Usually they just need internet access or maybe one or two other things. So we've got a video that we'd like to show you that kind of illustrates this in a really real world case uh, that's pretty fascinating. The race is on to get a fully right self-driving car to run like the car company out with the ice policy and cars that drive themselves. Opticon's new cars are cool. Two Destroyed data and deleted the backups. We can recover most of it, but some of the research may be gone for good. According to the forensics, they may have had access to the blueprints. The FBI arrested a San Francisco man in connection with last month's Opticon. Hey, Brian, did you get you anything? Coffee or soda or something? No. Start? No. So, walk me through it, step by step. Well, I took over the website to a bowling alley. Brian, this is not a joke. Okay, look. They have this research facility down the peninsula, and they're working on uh, optical tracking cameras for driverless cars. So, just searching through social media, I get the names of a whole bunch of engineers who are working there. And as I'm looking them up, I come across this bowling league where a bunch of tech companies play every Wednesday. And this is an old school bowling alley with this really ancient website. And it has all the league info, company names, player names. Okay, so you hacked into a bowling alley website. Yeah. All right, explain how that works. It's called an iframe injection attack. It's this old exploit that hits anyone that visits the website. So a week later, this guy from Opticon suddenly has my malware on his laptop. I couldn't believe it worked, it was like a joke. What does that get you? Well, the next day he goes to work mm -hmm. and he opens his laptop and he connects to the network. And that's it, I'm in. Yeah, but that still doesn't get you inside. I mean, they discovered it, they wiped the laptop, scanned the network. Uh, they didn't scan the whole network. The thermostat's part of the network. It's inside the firewall, it's connected to Opticon's entire network. You can get the whole standard configuration and password online in 30 seconds. I got it off the manufacturer's website. So they scanned most of the network. They didn't scan the thermostat. Then what? Then I just went exploring. It was a totally flat network, no subnets or anything. I could see everything, HR files, legal documents, R&D. When I found the blueprints, I realized I could make some money off these files. What happened after you sent the files? Oh, then I burned everything down. I wiped everything I could find, I encrypted drives and deleted backups. Is the number down? I can't get the server. server. The, the servers look corrupt. We're going to have to do a full restore the from the backups. No, the backups are encrypted. This is deliberate. This is a major breach. Oh, malware. We, we got to call the FBI. I was just scared. I was trying to cover my tracks. And somebody paid you how much exactly? 75 bitcoins. Nice. Not enough to retire on, but uh, still. All right, Brian Page. Are you sure you don't know who paid you? European automaker QCar has beaten Opticon to market with their QX sedan, the world's first self-driving car. Opticon shares tumbled 11%.
So that guy was basically just a script kitty. He didn't find a new exploit. He looked at published CVEs on uh, unpatched website, exploited something that was well known um, using canned tools. Uh, and that's very easy to do. You don't need any training. Um, anybody in here could learn how to do that in a couple of hours. Um, the way ICE and policy would help defend against that is pretty simple. Um, when a new device is connected to the network, based on its authentication or lack of authentication, uh, a policy can be dynamically assigned to it no matter where it is in the network. It can be wired, it can be wireless, it can move to a different port. It doesn't matter where it goes, the policy follows that device. And those IoT type devices like a thermostat probably need nothing but internet access and maybe one special one-off application. There's no reason for it to, ha uh, to be fully accessible on the network and ICE makes that very easy. So even if you have a flat network, that would be functionally impossible to break out and start building ACLs and, uh, and other secure zones. You can do that dynamically with ICE and everything can literally set in the same VLAN and not communicate to anything you don't allow. That, that security group tag, which is the underlying technology, like on the packet level, uh, is applied at the ingress port where that device connects to the network and that's where you control their access, as close to that device as you can possibly get. Yeah, so that's where TrustSec comes in. TrustSec isn't necessarily a new product. Uh, it, Cisco's kind of rebranded it uh, to, uh, to, to be called TrustSec. Essentially, what TrustSec is, is it, it, it does your micro-segmentation for you using what's called source group tags. So source group tags, or SGTs, think of it as a uh, layer two, uh, it's a tag inserted into the layer two header that identifies that particular device, and that's how you apply that policy to that device. Um, so from ICE or DNA Center, which we're going to talk about next, you can categorize those devices, apply a policy that's intuitive, and uh, uh, then dynamically control what that device can or cannot talk to on the network. Um, one of the benefits of TrustSec is it, it doesn't require any kind of topology changes. You're not going to have to re-architect your network. You're not going to have to create new VLANs. You can just, if you have a flat network today, there's probably reasons to move away from that, but um, for all intents and purposes, you could continue to use that and implement something like TrustSec to, uh, to properly segment that traffic. Um, so it gives you the ability to control that north-south traffic in and out of your data center as well as east-west traffic on your, on your local area network. Um, you can take it a step further with another product we're not gonna go in depth on, but it's called StealthWatch. StealthWatch is a, uh, basically a, a tool for monitoring NetFlow data. And so with DNA Center at the top and StealthWatch and ICE down below, you now get visibility into the actual data flows. The applications communicate on your network, who are they talking to? And with that information, you can then create your policies that make sense uh, and apply them. Um, So that kind of, anyone have any questions about network segmentation or TrustSec or like ICE? Use cases for ICE? Um, do you, you, you're using ICE. Do you have like a particular use case that it's on? Specifically wireless authentication. Wireless authentication. Okay. So uh, in my past life in casino gaming, one of the problems we had was uh, surveillance IT would work at 15 different locations. They typically worked in, a, in a, their IT uh, staffing office, but they would move to the various casino sites. And at every site, we had a DHCP reservation for that user, a, an ACL, and an iOS or Catalyst switch. Um, and this was never updated. It was very micromanaging, and it resulted in like literally thousands of ACLs spread across dozens of sites that was impossible to manage and really wasn't doing the, the security task that we wanted it to. Um, with ICE, you can identify user as a member of IT surveillance. U user has is authorized to access these protected systems uh, while they're located at these particular sites. So I can say who it is, when they're allowed to access it, and where they're allowed to access it from. I can even define it to where they're only allowed that access when they're logged in from their specific workstation. So if they go and borrow someone's laptop, they're no longer authorized anymore because that machine hasn't been profiled for security to be on that secure network. So like the who, what, when, where of an individual and it follows them anywhere inside your network, including when they're VPN connected from the outside world. So anything else? 
Nice. Or no. Okay. Um, any other questions on that? Thoughts? Cool. All right. Next up, uh, network visibility and control with DNA Center. Um, this will be very brief. Um, just to introduce you to DNA Center, is anybody here an early adopter of DNA Center or seen it demonstrated yet? So, who's heard of it? Okay. So, who's heard of Prime Infrastructure? No problem. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Prime probably wasn't super well adopted, but it was fairly common in larger enterprises. It was a first attempt of uh, centralized control of a enterprise campus network. Um, Another product called APIC EM, anybody? Yeah, that's even less adoption, uh, very, very little usage out there. Um, takes what Prime does and adds to it, but there's very little overlap. And APIC is about plug and play provisioning, um, network visibility, you can uh, trace a packet across the network between endpoints and see how latency and other things are effect, uh, impacting that, uh, that application. Uh, drag and drop QoS, where QoS is no longer um, you know, a few hundred lines in a switch or a router, it becomes a visual representation with drag and drop applications uh, as you prioritize them. That was what Prime and APIC did. Um, DNA Center is taking all that functionality, uh, simplifying it further, and moving it into a single pane of glass. Um, so. I like this quote from Bob Dylan. It's kind of like the, I don't know, the motto of my career. Everything we do changes all the time, and if you don't change with it, um, you're going to get left behind. And uh, the, the networks and the number of devices that are on them is, are getting bigger. And as a result, the, the use of traditional CLI to manage your network is declining. Uh, APIs are the way moving forward that uh, Cisco and other manufacturers are uh, enabling us to interact with their hardware and software. Uh, and that programmability is a major, major shift for us, but as network engineers, it gives us much greater reach without additional headcount or outside support. Um, and if anybody here has used Meraki, that's software-defined networking. It's, it, we'll call it canned, you know, you have a limited subset of control, but it allows one network engineer to control hundreds of thousands of sites with much less effort than a traditional architecture. And DNA Center is bringing that back to Cisco's core portfolio. Um, so um, I guess I had a question. How many of you could produce an accurate representation of your network today and the application data flows that are on it? You don't have a network. That's right. So he can draw his. We're not so, talking about and, your home and, network. Like, and that, that's, a, that, that's a rigged question because um, I only know uh, one customer who could ever do that, and it was never when I was one, uh, and it's because Clayton actually built that for them. So, uh, oh, yeah, which is but, very manual. Yeah, and, and even with our tools, it was a manual process. Um, and we don't have a lot of visibility to our network as it is configured today, and uh, we definitely don't know much about the applications that run on those networks. Um, over the next two years, uh, we're probably going to see the average number of devices per user on a network go from around six to 12 or more. It's going to double in two years. So is it, are, how many of you could continue to manage your network as you are managing it today if it were to double in 12 to, 12 to 24 months in size? And, uh, so, and that's what DNA Center allows us to do. Um, within that platform, we have the ability to design our network from a physical architecture uh, to interact with ICE for policy um, and to provision uh, new network equipment. And once all of that is done, assurance, the ability to check our work. Is it, are the, poli are the devices configured as we intended? Are the policies enabling the security that we also intended? Um, so uh, some of the use cases around DNA Center um, are around templatizing the deployment of standard network settings. So no matter what, even if you don't fully deploy a piece of equipment uh, using DNA Center, it can push standardized SNMP settings, standardized NTP, AAA, TACX, those ICE configurations that you put on a per port basis. Uh, all of that can be templatized and pushed. Um, new network devices can be onboarded with uh, network plug and play. And, I'll show you in a moment, they've kind of taken that to the next level. Um, and then uh, software and image management. So most people deploy a Cisco switch, uh, the firmware gets updated uh, during a catastrophic bug or never. And it sets, sets on the network forever. So 
even the security releases that come out every six to 12 months typically get skipped. Um, through DNA Center, we have a way to view what, it, what firmware is running on, the, uh, on those devices and keep them in, our com in compliance. And then we have uh, additionally in that dashboard the visibility and control, much like Meraki. What applications are being used, who's using them, what's the performance. Um, and like I said before, it'll be replacing slowly prime infrastructure, APKEM, and other uh, management tools as they get their functionality combined into uh, DNA Center. And the uh, integrations with other applications like ICE are, gonna, are getting deeper and more controlled to the point where eventually most of it will be managed from DNA Center. And uh, one of the things that you can do from here, um, at, if you, if you hate staying up late for network, uh, network changes for a change window, you can script network changes in advance, test them, and then schedule that change to occur during a change window with tests that follow the automated change to verify everything when is planned. And all you gotta do is wake up, check it, go back to sleep. No more manually pasting scripts into the switches. All of this can be pushed out on a, on a schedule. Um, plug and play, so network plug and play, Cisco's had ways to do that for a while. Uh, DHCP options, and you probably, if you have a Cisco phone system, that's how you get your TFTP uh, configs for the phones. Um, nothing new about that. Prime infrastructure was the uh, tool they used before to uh, provision a device configuration. Uh, then DNS, uh, you plug a device into your network, gets an IP. Uh, you have an A record on your Microsoft DNS server that points to the uh, DNA center or prime infrastructure server. Now that device will phone home, download its config. But what if you're plugging it into a new branch? If you run Meraki today, that's fine. You plug it in, you plug in the cable modem or whatever you're using, it phones to the Meraki cloud, downloads its config, and it's done. But you can't do that with an ISR router, an Aeronet access point, or a catalyst switch. Um, and the way you did that before was actually one step down the, the bootstrapping. You would actually have to open every box before you send it to a branch, plug a USB drive in, put a script on it, and then you could send it and it would phone home when it, once it got there. So what they've really done is kind of Maracified uh, device provisioning for that core portfolio. And uh, there is a Cisco cloud redirection to that uh, device helper. And your device straight out of the box uh, from Cisco will connect to this cloud, you have a dashboard where you input serial numbers and things, and all it does is points those devices back through your firewall uh, into your DNA center, uh, where it will then push the config and dial VPN tunnels or what, whatever kind of device it is. So, and you show I don't know if this will switch over properly. And I kind of skip over some of the capabilities in DNA Center because it's just superseding the products that came before it um, so around network management. Um, so you network visibility, um, it's going to build network diagrams of your switching and routing topology. It doesn't matter if it's the LAN or the WAN, all of that is built dynamically for you. No more Visio. Uh, it doesn't have a good picture here, but uh, there's one from Data Center Manager that's almost identical, and as you'll see, these user interfaces have uh, adopted a theme and interactive or inter interaction style that makes it very intuitive to switch between the products. But how is it, how is it uh, identifying the things? Identifying them? Yeah. So the traditional way is SNMP and SSH. Uh, now it is actually using uh, NetConf and Yang, which is, there will be no SNMP v4. Um, it's going to be a software API. Yang is the model, uh, I, the IETF has adopted. And that is how it is, getting information from the new switching. So think iOS, most of you probably aren't running it yet, but 16.x on the, the new 9300s um, supports the full suite of Yang models, which are standardized ways to query and configure a device. Um, and that, that's how it's interacting with them for the most part. And then the devices themselves phone home to the HTTPS website through a TLS tunnel. Yeah, I think that this is, DNA Center is really the future of networking for Cisco. Um, it, 
it's really user friendly, but it's extremely powerful. And, and like like Alan mentioned already, it's going to pull in data from all other all the other Cisco tools. So hopefully, what that means is for you is you're not going to have to be jumping in and out of multiple tools and SSH sessions into multiple devices. The goal is to be able to manage everything from DNA Center and get visibility into everything. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, a really powerful tool. I mean, imagine being able to take a switch out of the box, ship it somewhere, plug it into the network, it tries to do DHCP, gets its information for where DNA Center is located, phones home, downloads its configuration, <laughs> upgrades its firmware as needed, reboots, and uh, it's up and running uh, within a short period of time. So like Alan said, it, they're taking a lot of good things that Meraki has done and, and implementing those in, uh, in a Cisco core networking, oh. which is really cool. And use of this uh, dashboard, it's role-based. So if you have a help desk that you want to limit their ability to uh, well, damage things on your network, uh, you can give them a lot more access than you could easily do before. Um, and a way that they actually know how to interact with it. Yeah, you could give read-only access to a switch through TACX pretty simply, um, but would your help desk be able to do anything without significant training on that? Uh, here, it's a visual user interface that they can interact with much, much easier. So. Anybody have questions on DNA Center or thoughts? So there is a, a data sheet we have, and we can we can share that with anybody that, that shows what devices are supported. I think, is it iOS 15.0 and newer? If you have anything that can run 15 code, 15. it's going to work. Um, so if your device is fully into life and it's running 12, no, it won't be supported. But 2960 S's and X's are supported. Uh, 36, 3560s, uh, which are quite old now, are still supported because they run 15 code. There may be some functions that aren't fully there, but like more than 90% will be supported. So yeah, yeah. The, the uh, DNA Center isn't uh, today isn't intended for the Nexus platforms. The next topic we're going to discuss is involved in that. But and yeah, all your ISR routers, Catalyst switches, the new Catalyst 9Ks. Uh, all going to be supported. I don't know if it was officially announced. I know <coughs> the first time I, I heard it was in one of the NDA uh, sessions where you're not supposed to talk, but you know, whatever. Um, they're actually opening that API up to where DNA Center can manage non Cisco networking products. You got Juniper routers or firewalls, they can manage that. Uh, extreme networks, whatever, uh, mix and match. Will the functionality be somewhat more limited? Yeah, but the visibility, uh, the ability to query the device for basic information will all be there. And uh, yeah, a lot less vendor lock-in, I guess. So. Any other questions on DNA Center? Okay. All right, so let's talk about data center network manager. Yes. Yes. Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't recall that coming up. I think because it's all API driven. See. I'm sure if you wrote the scripts necessary to do it, it could it could get you some visibility. Um, but that I don't think it's built built into it. Did did you hear anything about that? There was something. So there's some funky stuff about what they call AWS calls it VPCs and how they handle the networking. Yeah. Um, so you don't get to do uh, easy mode stuff like anywhere you can run a CSR 1000, which is a cloud service. It's a virtual ISR. Anywhere you can run that router, full integration. Uh, I don't think you can run that in AWS. Um, but, so there is some limited interaction with that. Um, that stuff's pretty new. Okay, so. Nice. so data center network manager, I, I especially like this tool. Uh, it's, it's one of those tools that I don't think a lot of people even are aware of. Has anyone heard of Data Center ne Network Manager, DCNM? Anyone familiar with it? Okay, cool. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad in a way so I can tell you about it. Um, I'm kind of jazzed about it because I'm a big fan of uh, the whole Nexus platform. But uh, Data Center Network Manager, very similar look and feel to ICE, to the new DNA Center. Um, it really uh, manages these four areas. 
If you've ever done any kind of VXLAN, eVPN configuration, it's extremely complicated, it's tedious, it's not fun to do manually. It automates that whole process. So if you're, if you're ever interested in doing like a spine leaf configuration in your data center and using VXLAN, this will make that 100 times easier. Uh, then just classic management of your Nexus 1K, 2K, 5K, 7K, 9K. Again, think of it as a GUI for all of your Nexus platform installation, configuration, image management, stuff like that, IP media net, and then all of the SAN uh, management, which includes your fiber channel MDS switches, and then any of the Nexus switches that do native fiber channel. You can accomplish all of that within uh, Data Center Network Manager. The old version, which I, I barely knew about until recently, looked like this, um, kind of clunky, not pretty, not very uh, intuitive. So this is the old uh, UI, the new UI, which I think is, it's on the next slide, I'll show you. This is the architecture though. Uh, lots of APIs. So if you wanna do any sort of uh, scripting to query or automate things within DCNM, there, there's open APIs for that. Uh, but like I said, you can manage the whole Nexus platform as well as your MDS platform uh, with VMware integration and then also integrations into your different uh, storage arrays, Pure, um, NetApp, things like that, EMC, Dell, all that good stuff. Um, this is the GUI. Uh, looks familiar to the, to the other products we've already talked about. Um, this is uh, topology information. You can easily just click on one of those nodes, manipulate them, edit them. Um, it's very intuitive, very easy, um, things like that. Uh, one of my favorite features, though, for anyone that's done fiber channel configuration is traditionally with Cisco MDS, it was all command line based, which works fine, but it's difficult. Uh, it's really easy to make mistakes. Uh, this gives you an awesome GUI to create fiber channel aliases, fiber channel zones, zone sets, apply those zone sets uh, all within this uh, UI. Uh, it also has a really cool feature called SAN host redundancy check, which is a way of confirming that all of your hosts uh, have redundant connections across the fabrics to the storage. So again, it's this idea of assurance, which Cisco talks a lot about is not just policy and intuitive configuration, but then at the end, assurance that, that it's configured the way you want it to be configured. Um, the new version uh, 11, which comes out at the end of the month, they say, hopefully, hopefully that's true. It's going to add in vSAN management, port channel management, uh, inner vSAN routing, and then uh, it's also going to let you push licensing to the switches from DCNM. So a lot of those tasks that you would have been doing through command line, you can now do through uh, DCNM. Uh, so it's a really helpful tool. Anybody think that, does it, is anyone running Nexus switches now or MDS switches? A little bit? Would it, you think this would help? Having a GUI? I, I think it, I mean, if you, if you haven't started using Nexus platform yet, then this may not be of help to you at the moment, but should you move in that direction, this is a really How large is your uh, Nexus deployment? A pair of 9Ks or much larger? Yeah, 5Ks and 9Ks. 5Ks and 9s. Um, are they kind of in a hierarchy or are they kind of flat out or, or hierarchy of VPC pairs or? Okay. Yeah, we were actually really shocked. We started looking like, what does this take to add to a Nexus pro uh, a project? And it's insignificant um, in comparison to the cost of the switches. The base software is like 800 bucks uh, to add this on. And then the licensing per switch is a few hundred dollars. Uh, with the exception of the SAN component, that's where Cisco really like layers it on. That one's a little more expensive for like MDS. But if you're talking tr regular Nexus data switches, very simple add-on, um, and the OVA deploys like two CPU cores, very minimal requirements in your VM environment. So. And they'll give you a 60-day demo of it if you want to try it out. That's all I have for that. All right. Um, 
So I'm gonna talk about network programmability and uh, integration with bots. This part is super dorky, but I, I love it. Uh, and any of you that have talked to me about some of the stuff I do on the side, um, I love the bots and uh, pretty obsessed. So uh, I built a lab to demonstrate the uh, Meraki API integrations, and I'm gonna use Amazon's digital assistant, who I will not name, or I will try not to name, uh, to interact with my bot. Uh, my bot is a Python script running in a AWS Lambda like container. So the, it's free, and it's a little slow because they spin my container up every time I call it, so it might take five or 10 seconds for it to uh, respond. It's not her that's slow, it's that AWS instance. So, uh, Alexa, ask Meraki, who are you? She's slow. I am the omniscient Cisco Meraki cloud. Okay, so that, that is just uh, the uh, digital assistant skill uh, querying my uh, AWS instance there, just showing that connection. Uh, and the next ones are gonna be uh, me asking uh, that skill to use my script to query the Meraki API. So Alexa, ask Meraki, what is my license status? It's slower it's every especially time. slow today. Yeah, it's not normally quite that bad. Alexa, ask Meraki, what is my license status? Sorry, I'm not sure. See, yeah. And I'll get to that in a minute, but she is not really good at listening sometimes. Alexa, ask Meraki, what is my license status? Your license is okay and expires on April 29, 2019 which is 312 days from today. And I've, I've written some others, but since she's not listening well, I'm gonna to skip to the next one. <laughs> Alexa, ask Meraki, why is the internet slow? That's because among the 25 clients connected, the top bandwidth hog is Nest Cam downstairs. That device used 4,590 megabytes of data in the last 12 hours. 239% just on drop cam. So pretty bad at math in my script. Um, so I haven't figured out why my percentage is wrong yet, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep working on that. And um, so I'm just querying the dashboard and, and it's sending back whatever I ask for it. Um, the digital assistant has the ability to interpret variables as well, but she doesn't listen too well. Um, you can get a lot more in depth if you were actually typing to say a messenger bot uh, in Spark or Skype for Business or even something commercial like Facebook Messenger. Um, but I can also interact with the API to tell it to set a command. So Alexa, ask Meraki to block the network hog. She's still thinking. The device Alon's iPhone and Alon's iPad now applied with blocked. So I have some pre-configured policies in my Meraki dashboard just blocked. I don't allow internet access, but internal network access is allowed. So uh, in this case, the scenario is an abusive user uh, needs to have their internet cut off without a, cutting off their ability to do work. Uh, the policy get, gets applied to the devices used by that user. Boom, they're blocked. And uh, I'll have to remember to turn that off because my stuff won't work when I get home. So um, Alexa, ask Meraki, what is coming next? The first rule of Meraki roadmaps is we do not talk about Meraki roadmaps. So very dorky. Um, so that, that was just a canned interaction that we wrote in there. And uh, so Meraki's development team intends to keep the user interface on the dashboard as clean as possible. So a lot of compl network complexities are not configurable at all, especially in a Meraki network. Um, and they will never be present in the dashboard. Um, and so things like large scale deployments, I need to deploy 100 MXs or even 25. I import 25 devices, I configure 25. That's tedious in the dashboard. It can still take hours, even though it's still, e it's decidedly easier than doing it on a traditional ISR. Um, the API uh, for Meraki would allow me to script the deployment and uh, 
additional things I haven't set up, but uh, you have the ability to deploy hundreds of sites uh, in a single API call through a script. You give it a list of sites, a list of devices that you intend to put at that site, and it will push that to the Meraki cloud, and those sites can come online. You drop ship the equipment, the dashboard's already configured for you. Um, other features like SNMP in Meraki and in future Cisco uh, traditional devices like Catalyst is going to be limited. Like I said before, there's not going to be an SNMP v4 uh, that move towards the NetConf and Yang model for querying the device through a software API is the way it's gonna move forward. And that's the case right now with Meraki products. Um, one of the things that's been a pet peeve, and I think maybe, maybe you and I have had this conversation around uh, CPU utilization. How do you know what the CPU utilization of a Meraki MX is? You don't. It's not in the dashboard unless you're running beta. They did finally give you a little limited visualization of that. But if you wanna know, is my internet slow because my device is at 100% and it's taxed? Uh, you can't ask that, and there's no SNMP MIB available to query that even with an external polar like mm -hmm. SolarWinds or PRTG. But that is exposed to the API. You can ask it as many times as you want. And your tools like SolarWinds and PRTG and Logic Monitor all have the ability to run a script or an external script uh, that queries the device and then put that data back into a visual representation for you. Um, and it's not complicated. Uh, the the uh, API calls are written for you uh, by Meraki in their documentation. All you have to do is put in your, uh, your unique key and uh, your network ID, and then it'll query for you. Uh, it's just a way that they can authenticate that you're the one sending that request. So. Um, as you can tell from uh, Alexa misinterpreting some stuff, I should have said her name. Um, the, Natural language understanding is pretty limited. Uh, the next step that I'm gonna work on uh, is uh, using a more advanced uh, language understanding engine uh, like IBM's Watson um, to interpret intent and entities. So what the, uh, the bots, whether they be audio or in a messenger, are really doing is they're listening for an entity, an object or objects that you want to act on, and an intent, how you intend to act on those objects. So when I was sending a query, I'm saying ask for this information about this network or this device. Um, so I'm gonna work with Watson and uh, the next, and, and in addition to that, there's a lot more programmable variation when I use a messenger-based uh, bot framework because I'm typing and not speaking and it's just easier for the machine to not listen to an Oki speak, so. Um, uh, so there are bot frameworks for whatever uh, messenger platform that you're using. We use WebEx Teams, formerly Spark. Uh, there's a bot framework from Microsoft for Skype, Slack, Telegram, Facebook Messenger, you name it, there's probably an API. And all that API is doing is when you're typing in, it's sending your text to an external object. There, there really doesn't have to be any intelligence in that Spark uh, integration or that Skype for Business. It's just pushing that off and then listening for the returns uh, back from whatever uh, system you intend to use. Uh, these API integrations also work for uh, service desk platforms like ServiceNow, uh, Microsoft System Center Service Manager. Um, who, what help desk platforms are anybody using today like to do service tickets? Case. Case. Right. It's what? Oh, an online one? I, yeah. yeah. I can say pretty confidently anything you're using has an API option for a way to add new tickets. Uh, even if a user does something with a, a self-service bot, they'll have some way to publish that ticket there and insert a human interaction if you needed to. But uh, So um, what, what I did with Alexa is just a way to uh, demonstrate what's possible. Uh, and, there are a lot more uh, realistic, uh, real world, and more useful things that could be done with this. And the first thing that, uh, that I come from with that network focus is how do I de-escalate a help desk ticket from the help desk that goes into one of my engineering silos? I don't want a network engineer to be bothered with a VLAN change, but I know that my tier one help desk can't handle that task. So with, this, with these APIs, I can present through the help desk software a form that would be easily interpreted by that help desk technician to say change a VLAN. Rename the name on a phone so that every time somebody changes 
desk, that we don't have to have somebody escalate to my collaboration guy to put a different name on the phone or change the extension. We can de-escalate these tasks back down uh, to that tier one help desk. Uh, you can present additional troubleshooting information to that help desk uh, by giving them access to view application performance. Like when they call in and say, my CRM is slow. Well, is the whole system slow or is it slow for me or Hopefully, it's not the network. This is the application taking a long time to respond. Um, and then even taking that another step, most users don't want to call the help desk. That's like their least favorite thing to do. Um, and they would prefer self-service if it's possible. And if you're using these messenger platforms today, you have the ability to allow, uh, to de-escalate those help desk tickets that are tier one, like I forgot my Salesforce password. Okay, well if you're authenticated, and maybe I have some other security policies I want to go through, and you're using uh, Skype for business, I know you are you, maybe I have a few other controls, I can help them reset that Salesforce password. Um, I can, uh, you know, you name it on the task, I can rename a phone if I wanted to, uh, and some other things. So giving them access to that bot, and then also, if the bot fails, the ability for that bot to take everything that went on, throw it into the ticket, as they get connected to the help desk so that they're not starting all over again thinking I just wasted 10 minutes of my time uh, interacting with this dumb machine. Um, so, And uh, the, way we, uh, the way we would want to like, tackle like these uh, automation projects and, uh, is to kind of consider the top five or 10 things that plague your help desk or, the, or your organization and tackle them one at a time. If a ticket comes in every single day and takes 10 minutes, and it does take you a couple days to automate it, that's every single day's 10 minutes, 365 days a year. That's a lot of time back to your help desk or back to your engineers. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of... Uh, yeah, and reduces the possibility of user error too, if you've automated it. Yeah, so when you create these interactions for your help desk, you are limiting their ability to break something because you've given them a concise, uh, I don't know, a format uh, a form to fill out, and uh, they're not accessing all your network equipment, you know, fully open. So, um, as far as uh, what you can automate, you're, you're limited only by your imagination. Um, and this stuff, or this capability, is not restricted to large enterprises with unlimited resources. Um, everything here can be done at any size organization. Every tool that I use is completely free. And until you get quite large, you can even continue using those things like AWS and Watson and Alexa for free um, until the number of calls against to get big. And even then, it's, it's pretty cheap uh, on a per instance. But you're not running a full virtual machine in the cloud. You're running a, a shell of a, a, scripting, a scripting shell or a container. Yeah, one, one cool use case I thought of was imagine, um, you know, maybe some you're hearing reports that there's flaky behavior on the network. Things are slow, things are connectivity problems. Imagine in a, a chat session just asking the bot, in this case, is spanning tree blocking any ports? It, it go, the script goes out, queries every switch with the necessary command, show spanning tree, block pipe include, or pipe include block ports, or something like that, right? Returns to you, no. Nope. No, Spanish tree's not blocked. Or uh, is is any OSPF neighbors flapping? Goes out, queries all your equipment, returns an answer to you. It could be real simple stuff like that. That normally you would have to either go to syslog and look through logs, or you'd have to SSH into all of those devices and run show commands. You could automate a lot of that in in a in a real. Um, you have to make a little bit of an investment up front in, into creating the scripts, but once it's done, it, it's. Uh, I think it's gonna make your job a lot easier. And it may seem silly to uh, write a script that does you know, a show command on a switch, uh, spending four hours getting it perfected, uh, but if that task normally involves you logging into three, four devices, pulling out a laptop, you know, logging in through SSH into this device, into another device, or hopping through a jump box, or all the things, the four or five things that you might touch to get that information and act on it, if you just type it in and the bot runs all that for you, mm -hmm. uh, while you're on your cell phone, while you're out at lunch, you didn't have to rush back to the office on this kind of thing that probably happens all the time. Um, mm -hmm. That's a lot of time saved, much simpler. Yeah, you could, you could have that show output 
return back to your your messaging app, and you could actually see that output right on your mobile device, which, I mean. And you can make performance awesome. data available to uh, management. So uh, call centers, if you have a support center with, you know, one manager, 25, 30 people, and they're out to lunch, and they want to know what's the average wait time on my calls? Like, how do I present them uh, the wallboard data that I might have displayed in my contact center uh, to them while they're out there? Well, you can have it report to them through these bots, through Skype or, or Spark. And then they're not really interacting with the device so much as just querying whatever system that you have for its performance. So, and I think that's it. Devnet.com, is that the address? Devnet? There's devnet.cisco and then meraki.io is what I've been using. Devnet.cisco.com, has a, it's a whole website dedicated to it. Devnet, D-E-V-N-E-T, uh, .cisco.com, they've got a whole Huge online community with free resources, uh, free labs, uh, all kinds of stuff. It's absolutely unbelievable how many projects have already been automated. That all you have to do is plagiarize them to tweak them to your own organization. Very little upfront work on your part. Yeah, it's, it's just a combination of the uh, Lambda from AWS, mm -hmm. the Alexa skill kit, and yeah. uh, uh, some Python code, and I'm guessing like some JSON queries and things like that. Yeah, it's, yeah that's exactly it. That's all. That's the, all the components. The Alexa skill. Um, we have our intents here, and uh, I can add uh, slots with variables to those intents so that I can have uh, dynamic entities. All this is done here. You can. It has a GUI for you to input those things, and uh, or you can actually edit the JSON directly. So. Can you show us the code? Th yeah. This is the code. Oh, I'm on. Oh, I gotta exit the uh, slideshow. And. We'll be honest, neither one of us are programmers. So like there is a level of skill set you have to gain, but there are so many free resources out there. I mean, we're starting, we're wanting to learn this stuff uh, right now for this very purpose. So mine are, mine are all canned right now. So here are all the samples. So for getting the license information, here are all the different ways you could phrase that, that Alexa will forward that on. She who must not be named. All right. Um, the this is the a digital assistant skill. So yes, you can export it. I actually I exported all of it and wrote this in uh, text wrangler uh, so that I could modify it more easily and then send it. All right, Let's turn her off. Okay. Um, what I what I haven't defined here is you can actually do list, um, and it will allow you to fill in dynamic variables so that you can call an action on something. Um, she just doesn't hear very well, and it doesn't it doesn't work out as much as you would expect. But it works better through the chat interface. Through a chat interface, I can type a device name. So when we name our devices, we name them like nerds always. It's like my home stuff is Wabnet Dash MX One. Wabnet dash PC02. It's hard to say that, and, and she doesn't know what to do with it. Um, but if you're typing that, because you know what you name your systems, it's pretty easy. Uh, so what, what, what Alexa does is takes um, what it hears from these sample texts and then sends these, this variable, get license status. And this is the uh, Lambda instance on AWS. And we define through really just an else, an if else uh, loop, which one of these entities we're going to use, uh, and you can have additional variables pushed with it. And so it selects the uh, the tasks which are defined up here. So each one of these, you have your welcome response uh, and how it handles everything, the who are you, all of these, and the speech output or subroutines and all the subroutines are another python script and Meraki Cisco Meraki actually wrote the whole thing for us all of the api calls for everything that is accessible from Meraki is in this 4000 plus line uh, python document all you have to do is call the api uh, you don't need to know how any of it works it's just predefined you send it the variables you're uh, your API key, which is your authentication, you send it your network ID that defines your network, and from there it queries it and sends any commands.
Any questions about that before we move on? I know there's a lot, a lot of information. All right. Play a few minutes of uh, Cisco's net intuitive network video with everybody's hero, Tyrion. What is it that makes us unique? As human beings, how is it we come to know when something is right or wrong? How does experience shape our instinct? Is it intellect or something more? It's our intuitive mind that moves us forward. Right now, millions of new gadgets, devices, and things are connecting to the internet every day. More devices now than there are people. Think about that. Think about the complexities of that, the automating of that, the securing and protecting of that. We are entering a whole new era. So it makes sense that we can use a very different kind of network. One that sees all this complexity as the enemy and understands that intuition is the antidote. Because intuition is the most human element of all. It's what drives us, informs us. We try something, we learn, we adapt. We go from there. Now think what it would be like if a network could do the same thing. If it used intuition to drive itself. If it actually had insight, context. If it learned, if it could adapt, if it could predict, fix things before they break. If it could configure millions of connections, not in months or even days, but in minutes, Think if it could protect based on what it knew, what it had learned from every attack. If it saw threats, even the ones hiding in encrypted traffic, before they happened. So the more you tried to hack it, the smarter it became. That's the network for this new era. Guess what? It's here, now, among us. software to find. Um, a lot of what is used to have been done through command line is being moved to a GUI, basically. Uh, not to say that command line is going to completely go away in, you know, in the next five years, but it's definitely moving in that direction. Um, it's, it's important to familiarize yourself with this new, this new type of technology, the new way of managing your network. Um, and just be open to those changes. Uh, it's, you know, it's a change for everybody who works in the networking field. Um, I think Cisco's doing a really good job of evolving uh, to a more user-friendly uh, interface. I mean, anyone that's used any of their products, software products uh, from years past knows that they, were, they just weren't that great. Uh, they've come a long way. And uh, probably one of the best things is, is moving them all to HTML5 and and not using any Java, which I think everyone can appreciate. So um, really appreciate you guys coming. And uh, I guess if there's any other questions, we'd be happy to, to answer them. Or, or if you want to dive in deeper to any of these topics, we can, we can definitely do that another time too.